Hello there everybody, Sam's Trains here and welcome back to the railway. Today is a massive day for me because my 00 gauge Gladstone locomotive is finally complete and in this video I'm going to reveal it and also review it for you. This really has been a mammoth project for me. It's been going on for a little over a month, but let me tell you, it has been one of the best modeling experiences I have ever, ever encountered. I've seriously enjoyed every single minute of it, and I can reveal now that I am happy with the result. The result isn't 100% perfect, but I think it was worth the work. And it cost me almost nothing, and I've got quite a decent looking loco at the end of it, so that's pretty good as well. Right, are you ready for the big reveal then? So here is the Sam's Trains LBSC B1 Gladstone locomotive. And seriously, I am so, so happy with the way this loco turned out. I never, ever believed that I could be capable of producing something like this, not in a million years. Now, don't get me wrong, I know full well that if Backman or any other manufacturer picked this up and did a professional model of it, then mine wouldn't look anywhere close to what they could achieve. But the thing about me is that I've always believed that I've got two left hands, that I'm useless at painting and that I would never be any good at building kits. And so the fact that I've been able to churn this thing out has really, really taken me by surprise. So we'll take a closer look at this in just a second. I'll pop it down now so that I don't accidentally damage it. The next thing to say is that the design is now yours. I'm not going to enforce copyright on this design. It's public domain, completely free for you to download and use in whatever capacity you like. And hopefully I will have been able to put all of the like 30 files for this model onto Thingverse so that you can download them. And please, if you build this model, if you paint it up, if you put it in a different livery or the same livery as mine, please do send me videos and pictures of it. I would love to see how you get on. The next thing to talk about is the cost. How much did this locomotive cost me to produce? I'm going to reveal what it cost in just one second. I do want to say my figure doesn't include the hours put into building this. I don't consider those part of the cost anyway because for me, I really, really enjoy it. And for me, this hobby is all about paying your money and then getting so many hours of enjoyment out of what you've bought. And the number of hours I've gotten out of this loco for what I paid is astronomical compared with what you would get ready to run. So let's, shall we have a drum roll? There we go. How much did this double O gauge Gladstone locomotive cost me to produce? The figure is £24.99. Let's have applause. Hey. <laughs> Right, so I'm going to break down exactly what this thing cost, and it's not very much, you might be surprised to hear. So, approximately 100 grams of PLA plastic, that comes in at £2. One motor, coreless, £3.50. The paint, obviously, if you buy bottles of paint, it's going to cost you quite a lot, but obviously I don't use entire bottles, so the amount of paint used was in the region of £2. That's a slightly generous, uh, generous guess. One sheet of transfer paper. I managed to do all of the transfers in just one sheet of paper, and I forget what that cost. It's quite expensive stuff, but 65 pence. And as you can see on here, I've got multiple transfers so that I can mess several of them up and still have some spares. So there you go. I will include this in the free design if you want. Although if you want a different livery, then uh, you're on your own, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, 15 screws, well, that came out at about 20 pence. The N15 wheel set from Hornby.com, so that was £5.32, that's a lot of the money. The 42XX wheels for the tender and the trailing wheels, that's £9.32, that's the biggest expense. And then other small parts such as brass wire and shafts, again if I'm being very generous, £2, that's the absolute most these cost. So the £24.99 was the cost to me and don't forget that is the cost to me as a consumer if a factory was producing these things obviously they'd be buying this stuff in bulk so it would be much much cheaper for them so let's take a look at my gladstone i suppose i better do the unboxing bit there we go, that was a rushed one. I'm going for the world record, fastest ever unboxing. Anyway, we'll take a close look at the level of detail, but first here is some history on the class in real life. The LBSC B1 was a class of 36 naught 2 locomotives introduced in 1882 for express passenger work. 
Designed by William Stroudley, this would actually be his final express passenger design, and arguably his finest. I mean, look at this thing, they are beautiful. They were based on his previous Richmond class from four years earlier, except the Gladstones were larger, although to be fair, I can't really tell much difference. There were concerns over using the unusual 042 wheel configuration due to issues of stability, people said it would derail, but with such little weight over those trailing wheels, the design actually performed without any problems. One did famously derail once, but this was due to a bridge collapse. Withdrawal of every member of the class was sadly completed by 1933, meaning that no example survived into the BR era, at least not in service, because of course one example has been preserved, and that is this one. It's Gladstone, and it's part of the National Collection. So there she is, my LBSC Gladstone up close and personal for you. And I think this is probably the first model I've ever built that I've actually liked and enjoyed as a model in its own right, and not just because I've enjoyed the process of building it. That said, I am going to try and review this thing objectively as I would a professionally manufactured model because that really helps me learn how to improve and it also allows you guys to have a good look at the model up close. So first of all, as always, I will talk about the weight. So the total weight of the model is 150 grams. Now that is not an awful lot, unfortunately. The Loco itself weighs in at around 100 with all the paint and decoration and the tender comes in at basically 50. So by professional standards, that is not a very heavy loco, unfortunately. However, given the fact that this is entirely 3D printed in plastic with no die cast components, I don't think it's too bad. I'm pretty happy that it wasn't less than 150 grams, but obviously this thing is going to struggle with the large loads. On the subject of being critical, the elephant in the room for me at least is the colour matching because the colour on the boiler obviously doesn't match the colour of the splashes on the side of the cab and the tender to an extent. This is the one thing that I'm really not happy about with this model. But as the manufacturer of this model, I can explain to you how this happened. So the paintwork on the wheels, as you can see, we'll use this opportunity to show you that, which is I think quite neat and tidy considering, and also the paintwork on the boiler of the locomotive, that is all painted, that is directly painted onto the locomotive. The side of the cab though, and the splashes, if you look up close, you can tell that these are actually printed parts. So these are laser printed transfers, and I decided that the yellow on these components would be a part of the print. And the reasons for this are really, really complicated. And the way that these are applied is really complicated because typical printers do not print in white ink or white toner, which means that if I was to apply, let's say this Gladstone transfer onto the green splasher, then the color of the Gladstone text and also the yellow on top of it would not have any white in it. And in fact, the green behind would taint it. So what you're actually seeing here is several different layers of decoration. The first layer on the splasher itself is white, and then I applied a mask to the front of the splasher to keep the white there, and then sprayed green around it. So you've actually got a sort of white splasher shape on the front of the splasher onto which the transfer is placed. And I think this technique actually works amazingly well, except I didn't manage to match the color properly on the transfers that I printed. I did the tests, I scanned the results, and I tried to match it as best I could. Uh, unfortunately, it's just not that close, and the result is a little bit disappointing. But the transfers on the whole, I think, were a real success. I mean, the lining on the boiler, as you can see, has come out wonderfully. I mean, some manufacturers, I think I can objectively say this at last, do not have such quality lining as this. So that I'm really, really pleased with. It was a very scary process putting that on there, but it was able to work. Then as you can see, we've got the little builder's plate on the front splashers, which are all fully lined. And you've also got the running number on the side of the cab, which is painted. The buffer beams are also painted, as you can see with the lining, and they do have separately fitted buffers. They're not sprung, unfortunately. <laughs> like I said earlier on in another video, I don't quite have the technology to do that, but one day I might look into it. This is something I'm proud of, the copper chimney topper. This is not copper, this is painted, but um, yeah, the Viello, v Viello paint that I used is absolutely stunning. It does not look bad at all, which shows just how unreasonable it is that professionally manufactured locos should have such poor looking copper chimneys. Yeah, I was amazed when I saw that painted, absolutely amazing. 
And the whole smoke box area was just done with uh, masking tape and the airbrush, so nice and easy. Here's another look at the wheels. You've got the Hornby N15 wheels, which I masked up and painted. And of course, they have got the red coupling rods fitted to them. Uh, simple coupling rods, not the most detail on them, but uh, they had to be quite compact so that they would actually fit and run. And then every other wheel on the Loco is 3D printed with a Hornby 42XX metal tire uh, so that they look right and also pick up power. Let's take a look at some of the details then. So on the smoke box door, we have a separately fitted smoke box dart. Not a particularly fine one, unfortunately, but it, it is at least separately fitted. You've got the handrail above there and also the painted hinges of the smoke box door. You've got the little oiling points. Thank you to the people who commented on what that was for. Little oiling points on the front of the smoke box. You've got the separately fitted handrails, which are all 3D printed, as well as the metallic coloured reversing rod. Again, unfortunately made of plastic. Quality would be metal, but obviously I don't have the means to do that. And so on that note, we have the painted plastic safety valves, which are a little bit chunky, unfortunately, but again, I am limited by what the 3D printer I'm using is capable of. And the same is true of the whistle, which, you know, it doesn't look terrible, but it is a little bit chunky and it's not a patch on a proper metal one. And then on the other side, we have my favourite separately fitted part, which is the Westinghouse pump assembly. So, so happy with the way this turned out. It is hand painted, so it's not ultra precise or anything, but from any sort of distance, it does the job and looks okay, I think. Then on the underframe, we've got painted guard irons, which are part of the base keeper plate. And then you've got suspension springs and such that you can see between the spokes of the driving wheels. So it does have underframe detail. And then speaking of the cab, a missing detail is the glazing. Yeah, I didn't get glazing on this, unfortunately. I could put some sheets of transparent plastic on the inside of the cab, but uh, they wouldn't be flush or anything. I suppose that is something I could do. And then the side of the cab, we have the moulded, in inverted commas, moulded handrails, but they were actually to support the upper portion of the cab. Now we've got the separately painted, separately fitted roof on top of the cab, and then the piece de la resistance, we have the cab detail itself. Multiple different colours used, several separately fitted parts, including the reverser there and also the regulator, and I've even tried to pick out some of the paintwork on the gauges and such. Doesn't look great up close, but if I pull back a little bit, you can see it does look a lot better. I've managed to get a degree of close coupling between the Loco and the Tender. As you can see, this allows it to handle second radius no problem. First radius, I think that would be an issue. As you can see, the running plate of the Loco does not match the height of the running plate of the Tender. And that's because I actually raised the running plate of the Loco a tiny bit just to increase the clearances. And I didn't factor that into the design of the Tender, so that is a criticism. But <clears throat> I could do a dapple and say, the tender, folks, is just full of water. It's full of water and it's full of coal and the suspension springs, they've just let the, the tender body go down a little bit. That's all it is. It's actually a fully intentional part of the design. So this side of the tender didn't go so well in terms of the transfers. These were the first ones I did after the practice ones on the bodies I produced before that. To see the best work on the tender, you want to look at the other side. And as you can see, the transfers are a lot better. These are not 100% realistic. I think there needs to be less green and more yellow. So these sort of boxes need to be larger in order to be realistic. But again, that is a relatively minor thing to me. But if you want to build this kit yourself, then that's something you could fix if you wanted it to be fully realistic. In terms of separately fitted parts, we've got the coal load in the top there, which is a separate part, and that's actually untreated. That's exactly as it came off the 3D printer because I happen to like the finish. And then it's got the little toolboxes and such on the front of the tender, as well as a, a nicely formed, even if I say so myself, filler cap on there. And then you've got separately fitted handrails around the front of the tender. And at the back, you've got one of those toolboxes, which again is complete with the transfers and such. You've got a buffer beam with more painted buffers and lining, and then the NEM coupling, which is nice and level, as you can see, and fitted to the back. That coupling is also 3D printed. In terms of the finish, this Loco has a few coats of gloss varnish on it, which has made a really nice satin finish. I'm so happy with the finish on the boiler there. And, you know, if you look at the splashes, for instance, if you look at the running plate, even the tender, it's got a real shine to it, which is something you notice when you look at, well, at least photos of the real thing. So again, I'm really proud to have been able to replicate that. So there we go, that was a close look at my Gladstone. I think these close-up shots, as always with 3D printed stuff, are the cruelest. 
but I set out to improve on the Manning Wardle that I produced last time, and I think I definitely have. I think I've managed to edge this ever so slightly closer to professional standards. I'm not suggesting I'm there at the moment, and I'm not suggesting I'll ever be there, but I never thought I would be this close, and certainly there are sort of no horrible nicks and marks in the bodywork this time. I managed to fill all of the under extrusions in to give a much smoother result. So there are definite improvements, and I really, really enjoyed putting in that extra effort in order to achieve that. So now we're going to talk about the mechanism and the performance, and so for that I'm going to take this down onto the track. So there she is, the Sam's Trains Gladstone down onto the track, ready for some performance testing. Uh, it's such a beautiful class, isn't it? I'm just so relieved that I've been able to make a model that I like and enjoy because, like I say, I've always, always wanted a Gladstone. So we'll talk about performance in just a second, but first let me talk you through the mechanism. I'm not going to go into massive detail because I've, uh, well, you know exactly what the mechanism's like if you've seen the previous videos. I'll link up in the top corner if you haven't. Uh, but essentially we've got a decent number of pickups, so the driving wheels pick up and four of the six tender wheels pick up. Uh, I now have brass wire pickups on all of the wheels rather than copper strips because they reduce the drag. And that's the reason why I don't have all of the tender wheels picking up, uh, because obviously we're very limited on haulage capacity with this loco, and every wheel that has a pickup on it produces more drag. So I'm trying to include enough pickup so that it works reliably, but not go over the top and damage the pulling power. As you know, the base keeper plate is fully removable, so serviceability is absolutely fine, and the loco driving wheels do have proper bearings on them, which is what I would consider a quality feature. Unfortunately, the motor inside here is just a small coreless motor. It's unfortunate. I do like some coreless motors. These are not necessarily the highest quality, but they are small, and that was really important for this build because the body on this Loco is incredibly slim, and I needed one that would fit in this tiny area here as well as the gear train. It's also a cheap motor, like I say, £3.50, so it doesn't set you back very much. Again, no flywheel, unfortunately. Now, technically, there would have been space for a flywheel in sort of this area of the body, but that would have involved cutting the bottom of the boiler in order to get the chassis to fit into the body, and I didn't really want to do that. Ideally, a flywheel would have been great, but it was just a complication that I didn't want to enter into. And also, it would almost certainly have made the loco lighter because this part of the boiler is full of sort of wheel balancing weights and I'm not gonna get a 10 gram flywheel in that space with all of the clearances as well. So yeah, it's a pity about that, but it is what it is. The other thing about this is that the rear wheels, the trailing wheels on the Loco have zero weight on them. They are literally just there to look like they are part of the Loco. They don't actually serve any purpose and there's no spring on them either. Now the Loco actually works fine. It runs around my layout, which is a worst case scenario without derailing but that rear trailing wheel is not a particularly stable one. In reverse, you do sort of see it almost coming off the track. It doesn't, but it's not ultra stable. I think if you were to reverse it over points, then it probably would derail. Obviously, the solution there would be to put a small spring onto that axle to push it down onto the track, but again, I haven't done that because of weight. If this was a die-cast loco, it wouldn't be a problem, but any weight at all going down onto that rear trailing wheel is weight that is taken off the driving wheels, so I have decided against doing that. Now then, let's talk a little bit about performance. So the good news is the Loco works and I will show it running in just a second. The bad news is it's not performing quite as well as I expected or perhaps hoped it to. During the initial tests when I first put this chassis together, I managed to get it to crawl really, really nicely. It was a superb runner. But unfortunately, now that the pickups are on and the extra weight of the bodies there and the drag from the tender is added into the mix, it doesn't crawl very well anymore. And I, I reckon I could improve it if I sort of fettled it a little bit more and sort of troubleshooted it. But the fact is I'm terrified of damaging the paintwork on this Loco. It's super fragile, more fragile than a professionally manufactured model. And every time I take the body off and disassemble the thing, I run the risk of damaging the paintwork. So I've decided to cut my losses. I think there is a way to make this run better. I've seen this mechanism, this chassis run better than it does, but it isn't too bad. So let me show you the performance. So the good news is it works, as you can see. 
and uh, it is reasonably paced. So if I hit this with 50% speed, you can see that the gearing that I spent so much time developing uh, paid off. It's, it's pretty nice and smooth and steady. And at these speeds, it's fine. It does have a bit of a funny noise to it. The, uh, the same was true of my Manning Wardle. I'm not sure what the noise is. Maybe there's a bit too much clearance around the, uh, the gears in there and they're able to rattle around a little bit. Yeah, I don't know what that is. I, I suppose I could find a way to dampen a little bit. I don't know. But yeah, as you can see, the, uh, the motion is fairly smooth. It does seem to struggle a little bit though. Hang on, let's get it into shot again. There you go. So, I mean, it's okay. It, it does wheel slip though, doesn't it? It does look like it's wheel slipping, <laughs> which is weird. I think it is just the drag from the tender wheels. I mean, again, I could adjust the pickups so that, that they apply uh, less pressure onto the wheels, but again, it's just, I don't like fiddling with this thing. I think it works. I should just, I shouldn't gamble and try and be greedy and get even more performance out of it. It works and it looks okay, so I think we'll leave it there. Let's have another go at that uh, crawl. Yeah, I don't know why it, it wheel slips like that at the slow speed. That is a bit concerning, isn't it? Um, but you can hook it up to coaches and it will haul them no problem. So yeah, it's just a strange one. I guess it has to just overcome that uh, that friction at the low speeds. Anyway, let's see if I can crawl. So, I mean, that's that's about the limit of the crawl. It's not amazing or anything. It's fairly smooth, I suppose. Ooh. But it's not very slow, unfortunately. But at the higher speeds, it does it does become much smoother, which is good. As you can see, that's nice and smooth, isn't it? And technically, I haven't run this in. This has only done about ten minutes running so far, so maybe it will uh, it will get better with some running in. And I thought I would save the running in process until uh, until this video. So let's get it going. Let's hit it with fifty percent speed, which isn't too fast. Now let's see how it runs. So I think the speed is very sensible, as you can see. So the gearing did its job. And it's also nice and reliable. It wasn't cutting out all the time. It doesn't cut out on points. It doesn't hesitate on curves or anything. And uh, actually from a torque perspective, it's pretty good there as well. It doesn't hesitate and slow down around the second radius, as you can see. So it's not a great performer. I wish I had the technology to put some die cast on there because if that running plate was made of metal and if the chassis was made of metal, it would be such a great hauler, I reckon. It would it, All of that wheel slipping would go away straight away, I reckon. And uh, yeah, it would be a much better quality model, I suppose. But I have to keep reminding myself not to beat myself up about it. It was a very cheap model. It's built from scratch. It cost £24.99 to make. It would be quite unreasonable to expect much more of this thing. And like I say, I'm, I'm more than happy to cut my losses with this and say that I'm happy with it, despite one or two flaws. So I'm gonna let this run in for a little while. Uh, I'm not, I don't have time to do the full 30 minutes in each direction, but I should be able to manage 15. And then we'll come back and I will hook it up with some period coaches and we'll see what it looks like with a load. That I am looking forward to. Okay, see you shortly. Okay, folks, I am back. And up until now, I've been quite hard on myself about this loco. And don't get me wrong, that is well and good because this is not at the same standard as a ready-to-run manufacturer's locos. And to pretend otherwise would be incredibly big-headed and disingenuous. But I am going to allow myself, and please forgive me for this, I don't want to appear a big head, but I am going to allow myself to pat myself on the back very slightly for the mechanism. Because this is the first time that I've actually just sit and watched it run for an extended period. And I have to say, I've been really, really impressed with the way that it's run. The speed is really sensible, it's incredibly smooth. I didn't have high hopes for the performance of this Loco in reverse, but if I show you this clip, you can see it's actually running perfectly in reverse without derailing, which again is a small miracle given the instability of this rear trailing wheel, but even the small tight curves around Gordon's Hill, absolutely fine. Running at really low speed, this was 30% on the controller. You can see no slowing down or stuttering on those second radius curves. I mean, we've seen much more expensive locos perform far more horribly than that on the second radius there. So honestly, I'm so pleased with the way this performs. The only letdown is the crawl. I wish it was a better crawler and I, I don't really know why it isn't. But I mean, it's not 
it's not terrible, is it? It could be worse. But it's not great at the slow speed. But there is something else to shout about here, and that is the pulling power. This has really, really surprised me. How can a loco like this, I hear you ask, that wheel slips by itself without anything coupled to it at slow speeds possibly be considered a good hauler? Well, I hooked up my meter and 0.14 newtons is the result. That is about 12 coaches on straight and level track. Now, Batman Earl class is less than that, and that had a die-cast chassis and also a die-cast running plate. And the Dapol D-Class is even less than that without the traction tyres, and that had a die-cast boiler and a die-cast chassis. So I'm really eager to find out whether that is accurate. Can this Loco really haul any decent number of coaches? So we're going to experiment, we're going to find out. To start with, I've just set it up with my, well, the lightest possible rake of coaches I can. That is the three Hornby four-wheeler coaches. If it can haul those, we'll graduate to proper bogey coaches, and we'll see what this thing is capable of. I don't believe it, frankly. I don't believe that it will haul more than those three LBSC coaches. I think it will do those. But look, it's wheel slipping. The only thing I can think of is it once it's overcome the friction in the tender wheels and got up to speed, that maybe then it will be a better hauler. But yeah, this is I've never known such a light loco have such a good score on the um, on the on the old Newton meter. So obviously the obvious conclusion is Sam's lying and he's trying he's trying to make his model look better than it is. But hopefully if I get some coaches going, we'll be able to prove that that's not the case. So here we go, let's go try. Let's see if it'll haul the Hornby four wheelers. Here we go, look how smooth this is. So one of my big criticisms of other manufacturers is the ineptitude of their couplings. Dapol, Helgen, they have been victims of my criticism there in the past. So let's see if I've been able to do any better. Yep. An instant coupling, that's awesome. And, even better, it is hauling these coaches. Now, I have to be honest with you, if I don't sound too surprised, that's because I have tried it with these already. <laughs> so, I do know that it can haul these, but obviously it looks lovely with them, so I will run them for you. But I haven't ever tried anything more than these three LBSC coaches. So, beyond that, if I'm surprised, the, uh, yeah, the surprise is real. Okay, let's go for about almost 50. Okay, any slowdowns? Oh no. I mean, the loco might wheel slip, <laughs> but it's not going to uh, slow down. Those wheels just keep on pounding. Oh, look at this, folks. It's just so satisfying. So I think at this point I can consider it fit for purpose, but what about those claims of pulling power? Got to investigate that. Right, so the tiny little pre-grouping coaches have now turned into massive Southern Railway bogey coaches. I don't, I, feeling how light the loco is, I don't think it will do this. I think it will do it on the straight track here, on the level. But up Gordon's Hill, oh, I think it's going to struggle. Surely it's going to struggle. It's probably not going to do it at all. Anyway, let's find out. 50%. It's moving them. Here we go. Come on, Gladstone. You can do it, or maybe you can't. Oh, oh, that's really struggling. I saw it wheel slipping and obviously it did slow down, but oh, it's just about, oh, it's just about managed to do it. My God. So that's not bad. We've got to, add a, we've got to see it stop. Let's add a couple more. Right, well, we're pretty far back, but I've now got five large bogey coaches coupled up to the Gladstone. Now, according to my meter, I mean, it should be able to handle this on straight and level track. So let's find out whether that's true. Yeah, without too much of a problem. Let's go back again. Yeah, not a problem at all. Look at that. It's probably not, uh, it's probably feeling the burn, don't get me wrong. But let's see if it'll do it at 30. There we go, that's 30. Because it does struggle more at the slow speeds. But as you can see, yes, that's fine. So, you know, if you've got a level layout, you could make one of these and it's going to haul prototypical loads, right? Inclines, I think we're going to have a problem this time, folks. I don't think it will do this. I don't think it will get even halfway up. But we'll have to try. Let's see. 
All right, here we go at 50% speed. Maybe it needed more of a run-up than that, I don't know. Oh, come on, it really wants this. You can tell. Oh, I'll tell you what, it's going further than I thought. But I think it's going to stop. Oh. You know what, though, with a run-up? Oh, it's, you know what? It's not stopping. It keeps looking like it's going to stop. Oh, my God, it's done it. It has done it. You beauty. Oh, it's still fighting. It's still fighting. It's still fighting. I'm going to do this in one shot. I want to go up there and look, but it is still not giving up. I have never known a loco be this close to its limits before. Look, it still keeps going. It's like, no, we are going. I think it'll do it. I've never known a loco fail at this point. Come on. Oh my God. So, Dapple D-Class, eat your heart out. Sam's plastic Gladstone. <laughs> oh, that is insane. I didn't like that though. I'm taking those coaches off. Oh, let's have a celebration run past. Oh, it's uncoupled. <laughs> yeah, I agree, Gladstone. That was that was too much. Oh, that's hilarious. Well, you did the job, Gladstone, and actually thank you for uncoupling there, because I wasn't going to do that to you again. So, let's have a running session. Let me put the LBSC coaches back on. And just for the records, we have the Dapol D-Class hauling the same train and it's also on the same power setting on the controller. I'll show you that in a second. I mean, it's, it's struggling a lot more, isn't it? It seems to be going so much slower. But then again, the Gladstone stopped at one point and managed to start up again. So it's not a question of maintaining momentum. It looks like it's a torque issue that's slowing this thing down. It's doing well, though. It's managing slowly. Come on, you got to beat the Gladstone D-Class. You were 200 pounds. I don't know, you know, I don't know. It's not going to do it. It's, it's doing what the Gladstone did. It's still pushing. Oh, oh, oh. Come on. <laughs> I, I, sh I should want my Gladstone to beat this, but I want to see this do the same thing. Come on. Come on. Take it. You're so close. So there's not much in it. Not much in it, really, is there? There we go. Yeah, I couldn't say which one struggled the most. <laughs> oh, you cheat. Uh, I think I think Gladstone has to win them, folks. <laughs> the, to be fair, it's probably not the Dapol coupling to blame because that did happen with Gladstone. Uh, but it didn't happen on Gordon's Hill. But golly, look how much faster it's going now without the load. So I think Gladstone wins on torque. I can look at it go. If I can get the controller in. Yeah, just over 50 actually. And I better stop it before it crashes. Yeah, so it's definitely a question of torque there, isn't it? I mean, the D-Class weighs a lot more than this does, so if it had this mechanism inside it, then the D-Class would be the more powerful loco. But, I mean, this thing, the wheels don't slow down under load, it just keeps on going. The D-Class slowed down to a crawl. So I think I've got the edge there over some of the pro manufacturers on mechanism. I might not have beaten them on the crawl, that is true, but in terms of raw performance, in terms of, you know, mainline speeds, I think I got them. Yeah, it's, it's as good as I could hope. So there we go. Let's send Gladstone off. And then on, well, I'm going to have a bit of a Sam's Trains session today. Everything you're going to see running today is a Sam's Trains locomotive. So this is the Manning Wardle. Yeah, I think I've smashed it, really, haven't I? I think I have managed to raise the standards from this. I was pleased with myself when I did this. Now it looks like a load of rubbish compared to Gladstone. So things are going in the right direction and I'm, I'm pleased about that. So off it goes. And here is the next loco back in this progression. <laughs> and it's crazy because I 
I did this in the autumn. This was literally done within the last year, much less than the last year. When was it? Was it September or something like that? Yeah, I mean, this is hideous compared to the Gladstone. Gladstone's coming in just a second. So, yeah, I mean, I've been messing around. I feel like I've learnt a lot in this past uh, in this past year. I mean, a year ago, I hadn't designed anything. I hadn't 3D printed anything. So, yeah, it seems, seems to be going well. I mean, just, this thing is almost unworthy of being run. But, but, I got the mechanism even better on this first one. Look at that for a crawl. But it's because it's got a big five-pole motor in it, and not just a, a weeny little coreless one. Uh, but look at the size of the body. I had to make it a big fat thing to fit it in there. So wouldn't work for uh, serious models, unfortunately. So there you have it. That is such a satisfying process. And uh, of course, this design is yours if you want it. Now, if you haven't done anything like this before and you want to try it, uh, don't be daunted by the improved engine green livery. Um, to be honest, I was a madman to attempt it. And I don't really have the skills to pull it off properly, as you can see when we look at it up close. Uh, so if you want to try this, uh, think about what other liveries you could do. Try plain black. Imagine that it's wartime if you want. And uh, just, you know, paint the buffer beams red if you want to give it a try. And uh, just enjoy putting all the pieces together. You know, experiment with the mechanism. See if you can squeeze good performance out of it. And, you know, the separately fitted parts, it's easy to paint those because you can paint them separately away from the body and then fit them on. So you could always have the sort of uh, aluminium coloured handrails and that sort of thing and the reverser rod. So even if you painted all of the bodywork black or a nice blue or anything you like, it doesn't have to be realistic. Who cares about that? Uh, just enjoy it. Just get used to 3D printing stuff. Get used to assembling models and just try it. If you don't like using paintbrushes, figure that out and get a, an airbrush and see if that works better. Just uh, learn to produce models yourself, save a lot of money, and if you're like me, you will really, really enjoy yourself doing it. I seriously have had one of the best months of my life, which I realize is a very, very sad thing to admit, but it really has been just such a wonderful time producing this Loco, and I'm absolutely gutted that it's done and that I, I won't be you know, coming up for an hour a day and just tinkering with it and adding a bit more. Yeah, I'm gonna miss it. But I, I have a decent looking loco at the end of the day, which I'm so proud of, so, so happy with that. Oh, it's lovely. I'm so glad that I have a Gladstone at last. Well, this ought to be interesting, didn't it? Let's now try some ratings for this locomotive. Now, I've tried to be as objective as possible, but the fact of the matter is I am emotionally invested in this model, but I have tried to be honest here. If you disagree and you think I should have been harsher, by all means, comment down below and let me know. The level of detail, I've given a three. I think this is probably deserved. I gave the Manning Wardle a 2.5, and I think this is more detailed than that, if nothing else, but for the decoration. Uh, I think I would give this a four if the decoration was better. If all of the yellows matched, I might have been tempted to give this a four. But, you know, it doesn't have sprung buffers or any lighting on it, and some of the detailing is just, you know, plastic rather than metal. Uh, so it doesn't look as good as it would if it were metal. But there are parts of it that look decent. I think the lining is fantastic, and the copper chimney topper looks wonderful. I don't take credit for that. That's Valio, and they're really good quality paint. But it's done me proud with my model. Performance then, surprisingly good. I'm amazed at the performance of this. The crawl is not very good, which is a shame because that has dragged the performance mark down but great torque around the track, no slowing down on tight curves, even though it's not very balanced on that uh, sort of rubbish trailing wheel, doesn't cause it to derail forwards or backwards, at least not on points, and it's really, really, really smooth. Really good performer. I'm thoroughly, thoroughly pleased with the performance of this, and it just goes to show what good gearing can do, so that is wonderful. The pulling power, too, is much better than expected. 12 coaches or 0.14 newtons, I have no idea why it's as good as it is. <laughs> I mean, it must just be because of all of the weight on the driving wheels and none on the trailing wheels, but to have beaten, you know, Batman Locos and Dapol Locos uh, without traction tires is really quite something to say that it's all plastic. 
Mechanism then, uh, again, this is quite a strong aspect of the Loco because it's uh, it's built, the chassis is built like a ready to run Loco. So it's nice and accessible, really easy to service. It's got plenty of pickups, a couple of extra pickups would perhaps have been nice, but there is a good reason for it having fewer here and that's to maximize pulling power. Let's see, it's got proper bearings. Yeah, the only thing that lets it down and the reason I've knocked it down a mark is the motor, not the greatest motor in the world. And of course it doesn't have a flywheel. So maybe four star is a little bit generous there, but overall the mechanism is okay. The quality then I've had to give a two. I know that seems really harsh. Uh, let's start positive. I mean, this is a well-built loco, if I say so myself. Everything on it has been glued on very carefully and nothing is dropping off it, nothing is overly fragile. I think the decoration and the transfers are quite fragile, but even they're not too bad now that it's got a coat of gloss over the top. The real issues in the quality are, I think, the livery. You know, there are issues with the paintwork. It doesn't look great up close. The printed finish isn't the best. Really, I prefer sort of painted or tampo printed. Uh, yeah, the transfers don't look the greatest. Obviously, we've got the color matching. Like I say, that's not wonderful. And you have got the all plastic construction. So no die cast, uh, plastic whistles, plastic safety valves. I wish I had a way to make good looking metal ones, but the fact of the matter is I don't, and 3D printing them is the best I can personally do. Uh, but like I say, the build quality itself is okay. Value for money though, this is where I can wholeheartedly give it five star. £24.99 equals this thing. And £24.99 for this I think is wonderful. If a manufacturer did this, albeit to a higher standard, it would be £200 these days, easily, at the very least, probably quite a bit more. And so value for money is really top notch, I'm pleased with that. So that is an overall score then of 6.85 out of 10. That seems quite high, doesn't it? But I suppose the value for money has dragged that up and it does run well, so it deserves some points for that. Let's put it into the logbook then. Oh, it is actually bottom, okay, fair enough. I mean, we haven't got that many locos on the list, Fingers crossed it won't be in the bottom five at the end of the year. That would be really nice. But yeah, it's a, dis it's a deserving score, I think. I mean, it's not at the same standard as other ready-to-run models. And I think my score reflects that, which is only right, isn't it? So there we go. Those are my ratings, as honest as I can possibly make them. So thank you so much for watching, folks. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, yeah, I think this is, this is my, my best model to date, I think. And the future terrifies me, to be honest, because... How do you top improved engine green, really? I think what I might be best to do is pick a simpler livery next for my next loco and try and do it better, try and do it well. I think that would be the way to go. But I think we'll, we'll leave this one now. We'll bask in the glory of this for the time being and then we'll move on to the next project pretty soon. Uh, but my message is have a go. The files are free. All the de designs are yours if you want to use them. Uh, just have fun with it. Don't compare yourself to the pro manufacturers. Don't put pressure on yourself to be perfect. Um, just start. Just start. That's all it is. And then you've got something to improve for next time. Just build up your skills and save money and have fun at the same time. So thank you for watching, folks. And I will see you on the next video. All right. Cheers, everybody. See you on the next one.